Welcome to Africa's LSP podcast, where we explore the world of translation, interpretation, and localization, as well as connect with the language industry's top players. From language service providers to the businesses and individuals who rely on their services, we'll be delving into the challenges, opportunities, and trends shaping the industry. Join us as we discover the power of language and the impact it has on connecting Africa and the world. Brought to you by Bolingo Consult and hosted by Nat Kintela. Africa's LSP podcast is the go-to podcast for all things language in Africa. Welcome to Africa's LSP podcast, the go-to podcast for all things language in Africa. In this episode, we're looking at preserving and promoting African languages from the perspective of an African language activist. And I'm going to be doing this with Sylvain, an African language activist, ECOWAS freelance translator and founder of the Multilingualism Week conference. I've followed Sylvain for a while and I can tell that he's really passionate about African languages and their preservation. And he offers language services to organizations and individuals. We are thrilled to have Sylvain join us today to share his insights and experiences in the African language industry. Welcome, Sylvain, to Africa's LSP podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I know I've already introduced you, but from the horse's own mouth, would you want to tell our listeners who you are and briefly share with us what you do? Okay. Thank you so much. So my name is Sylvain Agbolo. I'm a Ghanaian, born in Ghana, and uh, professionally, I am a translator, a trained translator, freelance translator, and also an African language activist. And uh, currently, I'm the project manager at OB Translate. So basically, that is uh, what I do, and I'm actively in the language industry. Yeah. Nice. So like I said in the beginning, Sylvain, I have followed you for a while, and I can tell the enthusiasm with which you, you push African language preservation. I just want you to, to tell us about your journey as an African language activist. I mean, where and how it all started and how you became interested in language preservation. If you could kindly share that with us. Sure. So my journey as uh, an African language activist began, let me say, in 2019. I am the founder of Multilingualism Week Conference, uh, which we started in 2017. So in 2019, the theme which is annually given by FIT, which is the International Federation of Translators. The theme for 2019 was translation and indigenous languages. So while I was doing my research on the theme and preparing for the conference, I realized that there was a need for Africans to own their languages, their indigenous languages, or uh, for Africans to own their own mother tongue. So I was making the correlation between translation as a profession and African languages, being from the African perspective and being an African as well. So that is actually where my journey began. And since then, I've been talking about African languages, meeting people and engaging with others who are also activists of African languages and who are also doing something in light of uh, preserving African languages. So I've been following closely, writing articles, and also working in line of that. So basically, 2019 was a start for me as an African language activist and working in the language preservation circle. So if I get you right, you've actively been doing this for the past four, four years, yes. roughly? Yes. Yeah. That, however, wasn't when you started translation, was it? No, no. Right. And were you into interpretation as well, or just translation? I was not fully into interpretation until 2020. Okay. But for, for translation, it began in 2017. Right. So that was about some six years ago, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. So um, I'm asking these things because um, I want to ask a particular question. But before I go to that, what languages are you well-versed in? If it's African languages, then we, I have Chi and then Ever. Ever is my mother tongue, so I work into both African languages. And then international languages, I have uh, English and French. I did a bit of Arabic, but then I work from Arabic into 
English and French, not the other way around. But for English and French, vice versa, I work into either English or into French. And also for African languages, I work either into them or from these African languages. Yeah. Oh, so you do translations in Chi and Ewe as well? Yes, definitely. Oh, wow. I always thought it was just the French and the English. No, no. Nice, nice. So, here's the question. You've been in the language service industry for a while now, about six years as a linguist and um, roughly four years as, as an activist. Yes. Now, how have you seen the African language industry evolve over these years? And what are some of the challenges that you have seen, even some that you have faced yourself? And lastly, what are some of the opportunities that you see for African language activists and language service providers in Africa? Okay, so basically, uh, this is my take on your question, that the African language industry is evolving, though not personally at a pace that I would have wanted it to. However, uh, we are not sluggish uh, in terms of uh, being African language providers, uh, service providers, that is, uh, providing language services into or from African languages. The industry is evolving day in and day out. However, there is more we can do. So last year, I started writing a series of uh, articles on stakeholders that actually can't promote and should promote African languages. Some of them are language uh, professionals, translators, interpreters, um, policy makers, governments, you know, uh, publishers, and all of that. And so I've realized that if we do not own our languages, there's nothing we can do about preserving our African languages. And so the language industry must keep uh, acting or should continue to act in the preservation of the African languages in that translators, publishers also have a role to play because most of them say that one of the challenges is that people do not really buy uh, books published in African languages. That should not be the case because this is a collaborative effort to preserve African languages. Parents should buy books uh, that are written in African languages for their children. Government should also buy books that are written in African languages so that these books can be used in the various schools. Authors, writers, should not only, especially I'm talking about African writers, should not only write in English or the colonial uh, languages like English, French, Portuguese and all of that. They should also write in their mother tongue because they can write in their mother tongue. The beautiful ideas that they pen down in their books should be also transferred into uh, their mother tongue. If, in case they cannot, then they should seek for translators who can actually translate into the mother tongue. So take, for instance, uh, this renowned author, Nguji Wathiongo. In 2019, decided never to write in English anymore unless he writes in Gikuyu or or other African languages that he, he understands. And then until that is done, before he will actually translate it into English. Why? Because he said in his quote, and I quote him, if you know how to speak your mother tongue and learn other languages, that is empowerment. But if you do not know your mother tongue, but you know other languages, that is enslavement. That is where it begins. So there's a need for writers to follow the steps of Nguji Wathiongo. Translators should also better themselves in being able to take up these books that are in other languages and translate them uh, into into African languages. And just to say something remarkable that I saw on LinkedIn recently uh, by uh, Bolingo Consort, that is the, uh, is it AMI series? Yes, yes, AMI series. Yes. So that is a great initiative. Should other um, companies, organizations, LSPs, take up this initiative, it will help in promoting African languages. And the African language industry will greatly evolve. And you know, this book, the AMI series, is on climate change. Children should know what climate change is about. And when I did my research on the series, I think it's being translated into seven languages. Yes, seven languages. Yes. Uh, 
and then like it's in Zulu, it's yeah, in yeah. it's in uh, Swahili, it's in Ewe, it's in Chi. Chi, yes. It would yes, be very yes. great if it goes into Igbo, Yoruba, right, right. you know, Sisoto, and all of these languages. Right. You see that children, whilst they are growing up, these are things that they actually talk about at home. They know about it. Should you tell a child about climate change in English? The truth is that the child will find it difficult to understand what you're trying to say. But should you say it in the child's African language or the, the, the mother tongue of the child? You see that in using the examples that are available, you realize that the child will understand you better because these are the languages they speak at home, they, they play with when it comes to uh, playing with their comrades at home and even in school and all of that. So... Uh, it's incumbent on us as Africans, not just language professionals, not just the government. The government will do its bit, but then the core really lies on us as language professionals, as speakers of the language, to contribute our quota. Until then, the African language industry will evolve, surely, but at a slow pace, not uh, have the greater impact that we expect it to have. All right. So I really like these points that you've made. Um, I, I just want to find out how in your own small way you engage other language experts to discuss such trending issues in the language industry. I mean, issues surrounding these opportunities, these challenges, etc. that you've spoken about. And um, I'm also curious to know what kind of topics you guys typically discuss when, when, when you meet or when you engage each other. Okay, thank you very much for your question. So um, how do we engage language experts to discuss trending issues? Uh, it's simple. So let me just tell you a, a short history of how Multilingualism Week conference began. So in 2017, then I was a student at the School of Translators. Then I realized that there was a day dedicated to the celebration of uh, International Translators Day which is a day to commemorate the active work of language professionals across the globe to bridge the communication gap, you know, and also share what uh, translators do, you know, in helping individuals, in helping organizations such as the UN, because you know the UN has about six official languages, and uh, which is actually used, actively used in the United Nations. However, this cannot be done without the help of language professionals. So UN thought it twice in 1997 to dedicate a day to that. So in 2017, we realized that that day was not celebrated uh, in Ghana. And even in West Africa, it was at that time, it was just uh, Ivory Coast, if I remember correctly, Mali, and then Senegal that celebrated that day. It was not a huge celebration that you, you could easily find on the continent of Africa. So as a student, I realized that, oh, this is something we can do as students. I checked the day, it was 30th of September. That is the day that uh, we celebrate International Translators Day. So I said, okay, then we can do something. So I quickly drafted the concept note. I called a few friends as students. We came around the table and said, okay, we can do something. It's, it's doable, it's feasible. We wrote letters to people in two weeks, not. The truth is that in two weeks, we were able to organize that conference. And it was, it was the peak of uh, uh, <laughs> our excitement. And the funny thing is that we, we brought external language experts from Legon, from Trinity, because Trinity was also into uh, Bible translation. So we brought someone who could talk to us about religious translation. And we brought someone from Pamsit in the University of Ghana uh, who came to talk about uh, translation and interpretation and all of that. So we, that is how Multilingualism Week Conference began. However, in 2017, it began as International Translation Day Ghana, you know. So it was just a day that we used uh, to celebrate language professionals in Ghana. And it was held at the uh, East Legon campus of the Ghana Institute of Languages, now University of Media, Arts and Communication, UNIMAC. Okay, so that is where we organized the conference for the first time. Then we said, after the conference, we had a great number. At that time, we had about 250 students come in. And it was self-sponsored. You know, students themselves, okay, okay take 10 cities, take 20 cities. We bought meat pie. We enjoyed ourselves. We learned a lot. And we realized the things we were hearing 
were things that were not taught or discussed in the classroom. So this is where we began to, to think outside the box, to think about our career after our program, whilst we were engaging these professionals. We even invited people who were not in Ghana, and we paid for their transportation to come all the way to, to Accra to talk to us. And so it was a great success in 2017. 2018, we continued. 2019, we did the same thing. That is when we had the, the theme, Translation and Indigenous Languages. So that was when we stopped having it on uh, in-person program because in 2020, we had COVID-19. Then we said, okay, COVID-19, what do we do? Then we moved online. And it was great success because we were able to engage people across the globe. And I remember on Facebook, we had about 6,000 views and, and a lot of people were joining in, giving their comment and all of that. So since then, that is how we have been engaging. So by then, Multilingualism Week Conference has not been the only way I have been engaging uh, other experts. We organize a lot of uh, conferences and also webinars to talk about trending issues in the language industry, especially in Africa and African languages as well. And also, uh, mostly I'm being invited to talk on uh, African languages and also the translation industry and all of that. So webinars is one great way that we use to engage with language experts. But then the impact of it is that people get to know of what you're doing and you also get to know of what people are doing and collaboratively because we have one overarching goal which is actually promote African languages. How can we better ourselves as African language experts? You know, so this is what we do when we, we talk about it. So we talk about localization, we talk about uh, audiovisual translation, subtitling. So Multilingualism Week Conference, the name came as a result of the fact that we said, okay, we should not celebrate this day on just a day, which is 30th September. And what we realize is that the, the benchmark we usually have for time is two hours. But then after the two hours, people do not want to leave the room. So we just leave the room and, and it goes as far as three hours, even three hours, 30 minutes. That was in 2020 or 2021. We, we just had to leave the room. People were networking and all of that. So the committee decided that, okay, instead of organizing it in a day, then let's stretch it to a week. Because International Translation Day is just for 30th. So let us, let us actually change the name to Multilingualism Week Conference, where we dedicate the whole week to the celebration of language professionals. So we talk about anything multilingualism, from preservation of languages to uh, the different stakeholders analyzing our uh, impact, our contribution as stakeholders in the language industry, and also precisely talking about how burden translators or language professionals can better hone their skills as language professionals and better prepare themselves after school. So that has been the focus, preparing the young generation of language professionals for the future. So these are some of the things that we actually discuss. Right, right. Um, as you were speaking, that one question kept coming to mind. I'm looking at all these things that you've been through. I'm looking at the evolution or um, should I say the growth of the multilingualism conference right from its inception till now. Everything that you've been through, um, even the fact that you guys were self-funding it, even as students, you must have this great vision for the African language industry that um, most people do not see. Or, or, let, me, or let me say, most people do not yet see. And I think that is what motivates you to, to, to do this. And I can't help but ask, how do you as an African language activist see the African language industry developing in the future? And what role do you think language activists and language service providers will play in this development? Okay. The stark reality is that there is a large, huge very grand opportunity for African language professionals that is not yet tapped. The truth is that we have myriads of documents that must be translated into African languages. Let me give you just a clear example. Personally, I believe the reason why Africa is not really developing as it should be is because we lack inclusivity. Not all Africans 
understand where we should go. Not all Africans understand the policies that are being drafted that affect them. And this is because of the communication gap that we have. It's so huge that, okay, let's take, for instance, African Union. How many Africans actually understand the work of African Union today? We have the African Free Trade Continental Area. My grandmother in the village, I can, I can tell you, I can hit my chest and tell you, she knows nothing about the African Free Trade Continental Area. <laughs> Even myself. Exactly. Exactly. However, the farmers whose produce are being transported cross-borderly do not understand where their produce are even going, cannot talk with investors themselves, cannot negotiate themselves. They are not actually in the food chain, but then they are actually at the bottom, the bottom of the bottom, where their produce go for just something small. They do not really understand what the African continental free trade is about. Just because they do not speak English, or they do not speak French, or Portuguese, or Spanish, or Arabic. African Union does not come to the level of the indigenous person. Does not come to the level of the average African. Until that is done, substantial impact cannot be seen. Inclusivity cannot be achieved. That is why we need a lot of African language service providers to be able to translate, interpret, do podcasts, do subtitling, do uh, short videos promoting what African Union intends to convey into the language of the people. And as Nelson Mandela said, if you speak to a man in another language or foreign language that he has learned, you are only speaking to his head. But if you speak to him in his mother tongue, you are speaking to his heart. So until we speak to the people in their mother tongue, all that we are doing is to speak to them to their heads and not to their hearts. And until their heart is changed, nothing substantial is going to come out of it. So the truth is that there is a huge opportunity for African languages. Last week, for instance, I had an opportunity from one of the biggest localization companies in the world, and they needed an Akan senior linguist to make sure that the translations that are done into chi or from chi are accurate. This is a company outside of Africa, and they were able to secure a project on African languages. Of course, uh, they are going to pay me, and maybe it's just a small amount. However, my question is, what are we doing as African language uh, service providers? Are we really actively working to take up these projects on the market? If we do not have it, then let's create the opportunities for, for ourselves and be the solution givers to these problems. You know? So let's begin to, as African language service providers, let's talk to publishers, let's talk to writers, let's engage with them, let's have meetings, webinars, let's talk with them and say, okay, we are going to give you a discount. Should we translate your books for you? Let's write to organizations. We are going to provide all your website. We will translate it for you at a little fee. And the reason why we are doing this is to just promote African languages and to make sure that the information you are given reach the indigenous people or reach the, the native people in this particular set, in the Vota region, in the northern region, in the eastern region, and what have you. This is how we can get it. It's not going to be easy, I agree. There are so many challenges that we will face, I agree. But if we do not take the step, to resolve these issues, the truth is that the solution will not come. The solution will not come. And I, and I agree with you fully. I agree with you 100% that um, the job of preserving and promoting African languages cannot be the job of only language activists and language services providers. And I agree with you fully that we as Africans have a role to play as custodians of our languages to help in the preservation and the promotion of our language. I want you to use this platform to speak with every African out there. Tell them how exactly can people support your work as an African language activist and what impact can their support have on the preservation of African languages? Okay, so this is what I would say. First of all, I'll start with uh, students that are learning translation. And usually, 
what we do in Africa is that when it comes to the teaching of translation, uh, students are actually trained in European languages. That is basically English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, Arabic, but not the African languages, their mother tongue itself. So the concentration on burden translators or language professionals, whether it's a, a formal education or informal education, a short course or whatever, these people should be introduced to the translation into or from African languages. That is number one. Two, language professionals as well. If you do not have an African language as your working language, you should start bettering your mother tongue as well so that you can also provide uh, language services into or from your mother tongue as well. And also for our government uh, policy makers and all of that, we should prioritize teaching and learning of African languages. It is high time that the medium of instruction in every African country should be the predominant African language spoken in that country. This is going to be a huge task. However, I believe that should we have a predominant language in a particular region, that language should be used. So in Ghana, for instance, if it is the Volta region, then ever should be used as a medium of instruction from the basic level, if possible, to the senior high level. When you go to the Ashanti region, it should be Chi. When you go to the Eastern region, it should be Ekapim Chi. When you go to the Central region, it should be Fante. So there is a clarion call that it is only us as Africans that can promote and preserve these languages. The truth is that to prevent extinction of a language, we need speakers. We do not just need speakers, but speakers that would also transfer the languages they speak to the next generation. Parents today do not see the need to speak, most parents, I would say, do not see the need to speak to their children in African languages. It's rather English, it's French, because they think they have the mentality that when you speak English or French or Portuguese or Chinese or their foreigner's language, that, is, that shows that you are really educated. That is not true. That is a, a huge myth. We should prioritize our African languages and then learn other languages as a way of bettering ourselves and also use it professionally. Because the more languages you speak, the more money you get, the more opportunities economically you, will be open to you. So prioritization of African languages at all levels should be our paramount uh, vision and we should work towards that. Great, Sylvain. So here's a quick follow-up to my previous question. And on the back of everything that you've just said, as an African language linguist and activist, what, what are your thoughts on the role of technology in the language industry, especially when it comes to AI and um, computer-assisted translation tools? I mean, how, how do we harness their power in our bid to preserve and promote African languages? So thank you so much for your question on how we can harness the power of artificial intelligence in uh, our sector as language professionals. The, the truth is that it's really important that we focus a bit of our attention to AI because of the digital world that we find ourselves in. So my advice to African language service providers will be to hone their skill in the use of AI, artificial intelligence, how to even use Microsoft Word. And it will shock you that a lot of students at the School of Translators do not really know how to use Microsoft Word when it comes to translation because we do not harness the power of AI. So there is a need for us to train burden translators, language professionals, using artificial intelligence tools computer-assisted translation tools, you know, because artificial intelligence and translation now in our day is inseparable. It is not perfect. There are so many debates around it. But then this is what I always tell people. Today, it has glitches and the people feeding the machine know that. So as it cannot do something, they look for solutions there and there. So in the nearest future, don't expect Google Translate, DeepL, or any other cut to or Obi Translate to be the same as it was yesterday. You should not expect it. It's going to be better and better and better. However, this is not to say that it will take the work of language professionals. No, it is not going to. But however, what it will do is to help language professionals work faster, more efficiently as well. So it actually promotes productivity 
LSB. And this is my solemn advice to every LSB. Hone your skill in artificial intelligence when it comes to the language industry. Do not demonize it. Seize it, learn from it, and use it for the sake of productivity. Points well noted. So to our listeners, you've heard from the language activist that AI does more good than harm as far as the language service industry is concerned. Okay, Sylvain, so as we bring this session to an end, I just want you to speak to us about the next Multilingualism Week conference. Tell us about when it's coming up, what the plans are, and what to expect. Okay. So over the years, since 2017, I can say for a fact that uh, we have an incredible planning committee. And then last year, we decided to have a greater version of what we did uh, last year. So this year, is surely is going to be in September from the 26th to 30th. And uh, we've not yet decided either to make it a five-day event or just a three-day. When we did it three days, it was impactful. We didn't want to stress people. But then uh, this year, we are looking forward to partnering with a lot of uh, LSPs, a lot of uh, language activists. So we are going to have a lot of activities. Uh, We are going to have competitions as well. And then uh, the awardees will be celebrated on that day. And so this year is going to be a wonderful time that we celebrate the Multilingualism Week conference. It's going to be a great time together with language professionals and Uh, people who just love language in general. So I would say that you should watch out for Multilingualism Week Conference 2023 because it's going to be a massive one from 26th to 30th of September this year. All right, listeners, so you heard it here first on the Africa's LSP podcast. The Multilingualism Week Conference is coming up in September from the 26th to the 30th. Keep that on your schedules. All right, Sylvain. Thank you very much for coming on to the Africa's LSP podcast. Thank you. And for sharing these nuggets of wisdom with us. We are really grateful. And as we usually do, we're going to share your LinkedIn profile along with this episode of the podcast so that those of our listeners who want to reach out to you can do that. And they can also find out more about the Multilingualism Week conference on your social media and on your LinkedIn profiles. Thank you once again, Sylvain, for coming on to the Africa's LSP podcast. Thank you, Tunat. It's, it's such a pleasure. And I'll say kudos to Bolingo Consort for the great work that they are doing in preserving African languages and uh, promoting African languages as well. It was a great pleasure being on this podcast and uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, of course, with the work you are doing, and if everyone does at least just a quarter of what you're doing, by um, latest 2030, all African languages should be preserved in good quality that we can all boast of. So kudos to you guys once again for the great work you're doing in promoting and preserving African languages. Thanks for tuning in to Africa's LSP podcast. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and learned something new. For feedback or inquiries, reach out to us at podcast at bolingoconsult.com. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite platforms. Until next time, stay curious and keep growing.